Hi, this is Charlie Montatuiello with Blue Bear Flutes and of course our website BlueBearFlutes.com the one website in the entire world that a YouTuber gets asked about most often. Uh, actually, I have people ask me, do you sell these flutes? And I'm like, uh, you know, did you watch the... I actually, I, you'll see it in the, in the comments, I say, did you watch the intro or the outro to my videos? And they're like, uh, no, I skipped through that part. And I'm like, you missed the best part. You know, go back and look and then tell me if we sell these. But uh, not being rude or anything, but some people are just oblivious. It's also in the description. Uh, it could be anywhere. But long story short, don't watch part of a video and expect to get the full experience. And that's actually what our video today's got going on. We're going to answer the age-old question, a question I have been asked for almost 38 years now. If I make a flute and... I didn't put any fingerings in it. I know the fundamental note is X, Y, Z. What is the placement of the fingerings? And that's kind of like working backwards. That's putting, that's like raising the horse from a colt and building a cart when it dies is what that is. And maybe that's a little too dark, but anyway, that's just, it's going in the wrong direction really to say the least. Um, it does remind me, and my answer will remind you, I hope, of um, some of the uh, Colombian and Peruvian uh, little airplane figurines that are made out of gold. I guess we might need to show a link to that or something. But, but anyway, people in South America, like thousands of years ago, used to make these little airplanes out of gold. And some people say, no, they're moths or birds or whatever. But they have like rudders and tail fins, and, and they're really... You know, they look like airplanes to me. Uh, and then, of course, there's that Egyptian picture with the helicopter in it. But, but anyway, I feel like those people seen something and they tried to duplicate it. Do you think that those gold airplane figurines that they made would fly? Probably not. Not unless you just threw it and then it's actually not really flying so much as it is a projectile at that point. But, but uh, anyway, it's the same thing with the flute. I'm going to show you which direction you need to go when it comes to making a flute, how to get started, how to get finished. I've got so many videos on making a flute. This video isn't going to be lengthy about that. This is just a real quick tip video. And it's going to show you basically from start to finish what you need to do. Um, the flute is a simple thing to make. Native American flutes are, of course, one of the simplest instruments I believe in the entire world. And this one, the design of it, the only one that's more simple than this is like the rimblown flutes, which are of course Native American and of course there's also Hawaiian rimblown flutes and Japanese shakuhachi rimblown flutes. But, but those flutes particularly are the only thing simpler than this. And all they are basically is a hollow tube, whereas the shakuhachi has a little slant on it and kinas do usually have a slant on them. But long story short, this is like the second easiest instrument in the entire world. The hardest part of making this instrument is the piece under this block. I have a dozen videos on that. The fingerings, though, are important, and they're relative, and they're specific all at the same time. It has to do with the inside diameter and the length of the flute. So back in the day, I used to have people ask me that question. I found the fundamental note of my tube, which isn't a flute at this point, it's a tube, I found the fundamental uh, note of my tube. That means no holes, the bottom note, right? The fundamental note is F. Where do I put the fingerings? And what they want me to respond with is take the diameter, divide that by three fourths, and multiply it by the length, and then start at the top, and that's going to be your first. That's crazy. Did Native Americans ever do that kind of stuff? I mean, we're mathematically inclined, and the people who invented the number zero, but that's just too much work. You're going about it all wrong. It's like building a vehicle and not deciding yet whether or not it's going to be an airplane or a boat. You know, There's some precursors to it being an airplane that you really need to think about before you start building this vehicle. And how it's going to get in the air is part of it, whether it's going to stay there or not, and if it's going to glide on its way down, or is it just going to be a projectile. Um, so, you really, the best thing to do is base your design. First, most important piece of information, base your design on another flute. Whether it's a pattern, or a physical flute you have in your hands, or something you've read about, 
or what have you, or word of mouth, base it on that. The first flute I ever made, my granddad taught me how to make this little Cherokee whistle. It's about seven inches long. I've talked about it in other videos and probably talked it to death and <laughs> made a lot of people happy, some people mad, and just here we are. But when I asked him where do I put the fingerings, he told me put them wherever you want to. Granddad was not a flute maker. Granddad was a woodworker, and he had made plenty of these little whistles in his life. But he said put the fingerings wherever you want. And what he meant was put them where it makes the right sound. You know, if you want it to be a one-hole flute, two-hole flute, four-hole flute, or whatever, put those fingerings where you feel like they belong. And with some research and development, eventually it turned into the four-hole whistles that we have today, which fortunately revitalized and brought back to life something that historically was very important that nobody else ever taught anybody how to make, so that's good. Uh, with this instrument, though, the diameter of the flute, the length of the sound chamber of the flute, is going to determine everything about where these fingerings go. Even in my book, where I give you dozens of schematics on how to make a whole different kinds of flutes, I tell you that these fingerings are relative. If you make your sound hole short and wide because you've been on some forum online and think that that's how you make it sound good, which historically doesn't have any significance, there's none of those floating around that people ever discovered, but if you did it that way, it's going to make these fingerings go in a completely different place. So in my book, I talk about the fingerings being relative. Um, if you make your track a certain depth, it's going to push these fingerings either down or up. And I can give you some hints on that. I've made a video on, uh, I believe it's called something like uh, changing your pattern to fit your materials. Uh, look that video up if you're one of these people that feel like you know, you've got to do this out of the other. Best thing to do though, like I say, experiment. That's how you're ever going to find out. Uh, you can use my patterns, but there again, if you change the size of the sound hole or the depth of your track, it's going to throw these fingerings off a little bit here or there, and you'll need either need to make them larger in diameter or possibly make them smaller. Or on your next flute, you know, we're talking about the second one already to perfect this design that you've come up with. On your next flute, if you decide that they need to be smaller in diameter, you might need to shift all of them down a quarter or a half of an inch. Um, that is how you make the notes lower, but the fingerings be about the same size. And it's kind of simple math. I mean, if and I say math, but I mean that facetiously. Um, if you play this note, and the vibrations travel down the flute, escape, some of them escape out of this hole, it's going to make that sound. If you cover that hole up, that's, I'll use six hole flute players out there, let's just pretend that's your third fingering. It doesn't exist, right? Now it's going to make a lower note. So what you do in your pattern, if, if you're uh, trying something and it doesn't work for you on the first flute, the second flute, you need to make that fingering further down the flute. And I actually have uh, two patterns that I kept over the years, they're like 20 something years old, um, where I had designed um, a specific flute. One of them was a fully solfagio flute. It would play nine fingerings, which we don't have nine fingers, you know, to play flutes with. You need to do some things here to make that happen. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it played nine notes, or maybe it was 13. I don't have to go back and revisit that sometime. But it played a lot of notes anyway. And um, I had to figure out where some of those notes were going to go because they were such minuscule amounts of frequencies apart that I had to adapt and change my design. And then the other thing I, I did was the uh, low D kenna. My low D kenna uh, went through a lot of phases. And finally, when the finished pattern, the finished design got done, it has tape all over a bunch of fingerings that I drilled, trying different areas and different things, because my goal was to make a flute that could be played comfortably, but played the notes that the low D kenna is going to play. And they were, of course, in a major scale, so it was important to have it a certain way. Major scale flutes, which historically these are not, major scale flutes um, are not, uh, they don't follow the pattern of your fingers are going to go here and there. This is a low E flute. A low E flute for me, medium sized hands, relatively easy to play. Um, I know people with small hands who can, who can play this with ease. But when it comes to designing the patterns that I used on making our flutes, 
I went through a number of different uh, phases. All of the patterns of all of the flutes that I make, all the five hole flutes that I make, are based on one flute. It's the oldest river cane flute I ever made. It was a copy of one that I had borrowed from some friends in the Eastern Band a long time ago, like 38 years ago. And um, that flute is where the fingerings for all these others come from. But if you hold it side by side, you'll see that it's in a different location because um, if you put the small high B tone flute uh, fingerings on this low E flute design and size, it's not going to produce a B or an E. It's going to sound like garbage. And so it took a lot of practice and, and willpower to, uh, to make that happen. And fortunately, I stuck with it and here we are today. But long story short, if you have a flute that plays a fundamental note and you don't have any fingerings on it, first of all, that's not how you make a flute. You make a flute based on whichever pattern and fingering design that you want it to be. So um, historically, there again, Native American flutes weren't in European scales. But if we're comparing apples and apples and, and saying this is blue and that's light blue, it's okay for me to say that some of the historical Native American flutes were close to A or high B or low, mid G or what have you. And that's really about it. Um, with that in mind, if you're gonna make a flute that is 14 inches long, you need to figure out how much of it's gonna be mouthpiece, where the sound hole is gonna start, how long the tube chamber is, how big around in diameter it is. And then you need to see if you have, and that is if you have a piece of material that's already that size, mind you. And then you need to see if you can find a pattern that finishes a flute off this about that size and then use that pattern to place these fingerings. There's no math that's going to correctly do this for you. There are uh, apps and, and programs online people have used for years and call me and say I followed this program to the T and it doesn't play right. And I'm like well that's your problem. Flutes are made by people. You've seen videos of mine where I have some very complicated machines helping me get these things started but flutes, this was made by my hands and my wife's hands. Uh, flutes are made by people, not by machines. Uh, if you want it to sound good, if you want it to play properly, if you have any uh, pride, you know, you'll go through the extra work and do it yourself and, and make it happen. Um, but as far as where should you put your fingerings, you really need a pattern to start with. Once you start with that pattern, then look around and say, oh, there's something that's this big around in diameter and this long or say, oh, here's a tool that I'm gonna make something this big around diameter and this long with, and then you'll know how big it should be, and then once you've got that put together, then you can put the fingerings in it, not the other way around. Remember, if you're gonna build an airplane, it doesn't need to have oars, okay? Or if you're gonna build a boat, it doesn't need to have wings, unless, of course, it's an air duct, but anyway. This is a, a really great sounding flute. I love it to death. I fortunately acquired it recently. <laughs> That tail stopped flapping around as soon as I started playing. She's half deaf though. Anyway, like I said, you've got in your mind now what it takes to make a flute. This part here, I've got a lot of videos on. It deserves a great deal of time and study. The inside of the flute, not really that important uh, as far as it being burr free and perfectly this and find that. You know, I've seen some ugly flutes on the inside that sounded magical. I mean, unbelievably so. Um, there's a lot of stuff to think about. We'll be covering a lot more of this in some upcoming videos. And most importantly, what I hope you got out of this is before you make a flute, figure out what pattern you're going to use. Otherwise, you're just making a tube. And the tube can make a sound, and you might consider it a flute, but it doesn't have any fingerings. So think about that. I know it's kind of like, you know, you need one before you do the other. Um, but, uh, but that's really important. Some, one other thing I'll leave with you too, I'm reminded when I think about this flute and how I acquired it. Um, some people don't realize if you play a fixed intonation instrument um, in the cold weather that it is going to be a different tone. So keep that in mind. Usually we tune 
in between 72 and 76 degrees in here in the shop. If it gets too hot, we cut it out. If it's uh, 85 or 90, I know exactly on my tuner what to set it to so that I compensate for the temperature and they come out perfect every time. Um, if it's 65 degrees, I can make a flute well that's at 65 degrees, but I usually prefer to keep the heat on and make that happen. So um, if you take this flute, which is perfectly in tune at 440 uh, A as an E flute, if you take it out to a temperature that's 50 degrees, you're going to come up with a whole different sounding instrument. Keep that in mind. But anyway, I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you haven't seen it yet, don't forget to check out my hundreds of other videos on making and playing Native American flutes. I've got tips and tricks on everything. Like I said, I've done this for a lot of my life. Um, I do have an upcoming video or two that I'm thinking of. I'm not going to tell you the names of them or what they're about, but there's a couple of them you might want to really keep an eye out for. They'll help you in a lot of ways. So I hope you are doing well. I hope you've had a good time enjoying uh, your Native American flutes whether you're playing or listening or building them, and uh, keep it up. That's the most important thing. That's how you're going to get anywhere with it, whether you're only going to make one or two, if they're only for yourself, or you're going to make a hundred of them for some kids down the road, like I've heard this story so many times. Uh, whatever it takes, uh, stick with it. But in any case, uh, you guys take care. Charlie Matotuyela signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. We'll see you really soon.